As cyclists, our undercarriage is often pushed to the limits just as much or more than our fitness. Constant motion, sweat, pressure, and vibration and harshness from rough roads can have a lot of negative effects. These could be things like general fatigue and soreness, chafing, but maybe even ulcers, especially on the very long rides we randonneurs enjoy. Now we can fight most of these things. We can fight sweat with polyester clothing. We can fight friction with chamois and chamois creams. And we can fight pressure by finding that perfect saddle or perhaps enjoying a weight loss plan. We can't control the road though. Any bumps we hit create a force spike right between the legs and rough roads impart a constant buzz of smaller impact. Rendering starts at over 200 kilometers and it only goes up from there. So these jolts to the groin can really add up over eight hours or more in the saddle. Welcome to Overbiked Randonneuring, where I hope to share the best equipment and practices for ultra-distance cycling. In today's video, I'll test if the Redshift Shockstop Pro Seat Post lives up to its promise to protect our precious perineums. Two years ago, I reviewed the Redshift Shockstop Stem and Pro Seat Post and found them to be indispensable components for long rides. I enjoyed them enough that my last bike was chosen specifically to use the system. But comfort is an oversimplification of what minimalist suspension systems accomplish. Exposure to vibration over time is mentally and physically fatiguing, which reduces performance and motivation. This impacts ultra-distance cyclists like randonneurs in ways that typical road cyclists don't experience. By reducing vibration from rough roads and the peak force of bumps, a suspension seat post like the Redshift Shockstop Pro should reduce the risk of chafing and saddle sores along with fatigue. To choose whether or not to buy into such a system, we need to be able to test it objectively and subjectively against alternatives, like changes in tire pressure, other suspension systems, or nothing at all. I've developed a test to do just that. I've repeated a test protocol I used to test changes in tire pressure and to test the Vecnum suspension stem. The protocol measures linear acceleration in meters per second squared in different road conditions, which can serve as a proxy to force. Equipment variables have vibration measured over a 1.6 kilometer test loop until at least three laps have clean data with no deviations caused by car or pedestrian traffic. Speed and cadence averages must also fall within a narrow range. Speed targets 23 kilometers per hour, a sensible average speed for a brevet, and cadence averages 83 RPM, which is also a pretty typical cadence. To regulate speed and cadence, the same gear combination is used throughout the entire test. The test course includes smooth and worn tarmac, large speed bumps, curb transitions, and a section of busted bike path. To measure linear acceleration, the Physics Toolbox app records accelerometer data 200 times per second. My phone is mounted to the saddle rails using an aluminum water bottle cage that's been connected to a phone mount like this. Tire pressure of 80 PSI was used in 295 millimeter mid-level tires with stock alloy rims. The stock alloy seat post was compared to the Redshift Shockstop Pro seat post. Data was collected from Physics Toolbox and analyzed in Microsoft Excel. Acceleration data was averaged and grouped into four buckets corresponding with course conditions. The lowest 50% of measurements are categorized as smooth tarmac, where the next 30% are worn roads. The next 15% are the highest 80 to 95% and are categorized as chip seal. This bucket of data is the anchor of other data organization. The bucket size correlates with the length of a continuous section of rough and busted bike path versus the total course length. Accelerometer data from this section averages the same as the 80th to 95th percentile bucket average. The roughest 5% of data are assumed to be hard hits from speed bumps and sidewalk transitions. Across the entire test loop, the Redshift Shockstop Pro seat post reduced vibrations and impacts by an average of about 16% compared to the stock alloy seat post. This rate of improvement was similar across all conditions. A 13.6% reduction in acceleration was seen on smooth tarmac, 15.3% on worn tarmac, 17.5% on rough chip seal, and 16.2% on hard hits. First impressions of data show impressive performance versus changes in tire pressure. In my Vecnum test, I also tested my 31 millimeter front tire on a carbon wheel with a rigid stem, which averaged just over 6% improvement per 10 PSI drop in pressure from 70 to 60 and to 50 PSI. 
to test for agreement between the seat post and handlebar mounting positions, or potentially find some anomalies, I ran a test of rear tire pressures at 70, 60, and 50 psi in my new 33 millimeter tires. A similar improvement of a little over 6% per 10 psi was also consistent across conditions. This data also suggests that to use a rigid seat post, I would need to drop my pressure by about 26 psi to match the comfort and vibration damping of the Redshift Shock Stop Pro seat post. Of course, this is impossible given that my preferred tire pressure is 56 or 58 psi, which is pretty consistent with recommendations from the Silka Tire Pressure Calculator. My rationale for purchasing and recommending the Redshift Shock Stop Pro seat post was, and still is, to be able to run a tire setup that's optimized for efficiency while still being isolated from road harshness. This seat post overcomes the problem of optimized tire setups being rather harsh for rides over 12 hours, and it's kind of a cheat code when faced with the speed efficiency trade-off that kind of otherwise exists at this high level of comfort. We can see from the data that the ShockStop Pro seat post performs really well, but it also does well subjectively. After using it for over two years, I can confirm that it's active enough to provide a good benefit, but it also kind of disappears when in use. It's not very noticeable. And the end result is a bike that can be really efficient, but is also comfortable and ends up being just a joy to ride. Uh, I can't really understand, I can't really rationalize using only tires for suspension when systems like this are available. But there are a lot of cases where this is just the requirement. Uh, for example, if you don't have a standard size seat post on your bike, which is becoming more and more common these days, it's impossible to fit. Others, uh, especially a lot of randonneurs, love giant balloon sized tires, and those, especially very wide ones, can provide the same level of comfort as the Redshift Shock Stop Pro seat post. Uh, the thing is, they have to be huge to do that. Hoop stress calculations suggest roughly a 48 millimeter tire at 21 PSI would be needed to match the comfort of my current setup. Testing is needed to validate this, but obviously this would roll really slowly on tarmac and is probably best saved for gravel adventures. Aside from corner cases where it isn't an option, any ultra endurance or long distance setup is going to benefit greatly from the Redshift Shockstop Pro seat post or even similar products. Redshift have updated the design, and they've replaced one of the elastomers with a spring, at least according to some recent videos. Quite curious how that performs. I would love to compare the ShockStop Pro to the Canyon VLCS S14 II, but I can't really justify the price for what I expect to be a worse performing product. But if any of you audience out there have one laying around, hit me up. Uh, what else would you like to see tested? Maybe wider tires? Narrower tires? Uh, changes in tire pressure and how they affect different widths? Uh, just let me know in the comments and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the upcoming Super STEM showdown between Redshift and Vectum. Ride safe and see you in the next video.